All right. My pleasure to bring to you Ms. Molly Kaiser and her paper, Till We Are Devoured.
the man's courage, the sheer pride of his line. They all come crashing home to her, over and over. His looks, his words. They come, they cling to her heart. No peace, no rest for her body. Love will give her none. The forgotten passion of love that had ignited in the heart of the queen greatly afflicted her. Guilt and shame plaguing her mind as her promise to Sykea slowly began to crumble. Dido's torment seeped into her words as she confides her forbidden love to her sister, Anna. I pray that the Almighty Father blast me with one bolt to the shades, the pale, glimmering shades in hell, before I dishonor you. He's carried my love away, the man who led me first. May he hold it tight, safeguard it in his grave. A significant piece of Dido's heart remained with her husband buried beneath the earth. She desperately desired to continue living as a sacrifice to him whom she loved first. Yet the remnants of her heart seemed to yearn for another. The queen's tragic fate began to seal as her sister encouraged her to give the gifts of love another chance. Even the goddesses Venus and Juno wished for the Trojan and Tyrian to bind together in marriage. Dido's new affections for Aeneas rose like a wild beast to challenge those of Sycaeus, both fiercely grappling for the mastery of the heart of the queen. Alas, the love of the Trojan leader was victor as the queen found herself trapped within a cave with Aeneas during the storm, vulnerable to the desires of the young man. As Virgil wrote, Juno, queen of marriage, gave the signal, and the high sky bore witness to the wedding. Nymphs on the mountaintops wailed out the wedding hymn. This was the first day of her death, the first of grief, the cause of it all. From now on, Dido cared no more for appearances, nor for reputation either. Dido had given herself completely and utterly to Aeneas. Although her heart had been mere pieces of a whole, she had offered all that remained as a sacrifice for her beloved. It is evident that Carthage's queen understood that love without sacrifice is void. With both Sycaeus and Aeneas, she was willing to risk her personal happiness or success for their sake. But Dido went beyond her own human capacity. Her care for herself and others in her life was entirely consumed by that of a particular object. Aeneas had a highest love but it was that of glory and destiny, which led him to mutilate that which was sacred. After an appearance from the god Mercury, the Trojan moved ready to ready his men for departure. Fit the fleet, he commanded, but not a word. Muster the crews to shore, all tackle set to sail, but the cause of our new course, you keep it secret. Of course, despite the attempts of secrecy, the news soon reached Dido that her guests were preparing to leave. The queen fell into despair. Can nothing hold you back? Not our love? Not the pledge once sealed with our right hands? Dido grasped at wisps of hope as she confronted her beloved. If I deserve any decency from you now, if anything mine has ever won your heart, I pray you, if prayers have any place, reject the scheme of yours. Dido pleaded with Aeneas to remain in Carthage, or at least postpone his departure so that her afflicted heart could learn to grieve. Yet the anguish of the woman was not enough to sway the heart of Aeneas. His focus and love rested in Rome. The spirit of the queen was shattered. The one whom she loved had no love for her in return. Dido had sacrificed everything, her reputation, her conscience, her very soul, to Aeneas. Yet he did not even sacrifice a tear for her sake. The rejection from the Trojan leader pushed the queen into a chasm from which she could not escape. The guilt of portraying her promise to Sycaeus, the one who had truly loved her, returned in unrelenting force. Her body and soul felt tainted, desecrated beyond repair or redemption. Dido yearned to break off from the light, the life she loathed. Her soul had already been slain, not by Aeneas's mere departure, but by the apathetic nature of the Trojan that made it clear to the queen that he had not loved her. 
upon a pyre, beer built from Aeneas' armor and clothes left behind, the tragic queen of Carthage thrust his sword deep into her body, dying a death undeserved. The story of Dido paints a gruesome picture of the power of self-sacrifice. The inclination of man to offer oneself is one that, at its core, is divine and pure. However, as is the nature of man, it is often that many distort this desire and cross a bridge they cannot return from. Dido's self-sacrificial love was so overwhelming, so focused on Cypheus and then Aeneas, that she destroyed herself. The love for her people, her sister, or herself was unable to rescue her. The second plaque was inlaid with the image of the warrior Achilles, kneeling before the flaming funeral pyre of Patroclus, unmarked corpses scattered about the surrounding earth. The words of the poet Homer were etched beneath the scene. Achilles, he's made his own proud spirit so wild in his chest, so savage, no one thought for his comrade's love. You, the gods have planted a cruel, relentless fury in your chest. Achilles, put some human kindness in your heart. Show respect for your own house. Achilles of Homer's The Iliad, similar to Dido, sacrificed everything for his highest love, although it was not just his own life that was an offering. The son of Thetis had a heart ruled by honor, which, accompanied by the disease of pride, influenced his actions and tainted his character. In the midst of the chaos of the Trojan War, Achilles and Agamemnon entered into dispute over the captive woman Briseis. The quarrel between the two ardent leaders ended in Achilles' pride wounded as Agamemnon took possession of the war trophy. The son of Thetis retaliated, making the egotistical decision to remove himself along with his Myrmidon soldiers from the battlefield. Regardless of the skill of the other Greek leaders, the absence of Achilles debilitated their efforts against Troy. Thousands of Achaean soldiers fell at the hand of their enemies as a consequence of the Myrmidon's leaders worship of his own honor. As countless soldiers were slaughtered, bathing the earth with blood, Agamemnon quickly moved to appease Achilles so to regain him and his men on the battlefield. <coughs> Odysseus, along with Phoenix and Ajax, approached the son of Thetis as ambassadors of Agamemnon. All hangs in the balance now, whether we save our benched ships or they are destroyed, unless, of course, you put your fighting power to harness. Odysseus, the great tactician, speaks first. A nightmare. I fear it. With all my heart, I fear it will be our fate to die in Troy, far from the stallion land of Argos. Up with you, now, late as it is, if you want to pull our Argus clear from the Trojan onslaught. Despite the armies of Argos dwindling under the force of Troy and the promise of replenished gifts from Agamemnon, Achilles' heart remained rigid sacrificing even more young men at his chosen shrine. The victims of Achilles' infatuation with his own honor did not stop at faceless Argus soldiers. Even those closest to the Myrmidon leader were of inadequate value. Patroclus, lost in his own innocence, condemned to beg for his own death and brutal doom, approached his dearest friend. Distraught over the failing efforts of the Greeks, Patroclus pleaded with Achilles to rejoin the war. The ears of the great warrior were deaf to the cries of his friends and the distant screams of his comrades. The rage sparked by wounded pride still hardened his heart. Let the whole Myrmidon army follow my command, Patroclus implored in a last desperate attempt. I might bring some light of victory to our Argus. And give me your armor to buckle on my back so the Trojans might take me for you, Achilles. Although the son of Thetis remained bent on refusing to return to battle himself, he did not deny his friends his request. Achilles surrendered his distinguished armor, saying to Patroclus, You can win great honor, great glory for me in the eyes of the Argus. Achilles was willing to send his dearest friend into the clutches of Troy, willing to sacrifice even the man he loved beyond all other comrades, loved as his own life. 
for the sake of his honor and pride. Patroclus, fierce and courageous in battle, gave the Achaean forces the mental and physical support they so desperately needed. The Trojan troops were pushed back from the Greek ships towards the gates of the city, and many fell at the sword of the Myrmidons. <coughs> but the momentary victory came with a sacrifice, that of a young soldier adorned in Achilles' armor. Patroclus crossed bronze with Hector, prince of Troy and leader of their army, a foe he was not destined to defeat. As when some lion overpowers a tireless boar up on a mountain summit, battling in all their fury over a little spring of water, when the lion beats down with the sheer brute force as the boar fights for breath, so now, with a close thrust, Hector, the son of Priam, tore the life from the fighting son of Menotius. While it was Hector's sword that struck the fatal blow, it was the selfish pride of Achilles that was responsible for the death of the Trojans. The tale of Achilles displays the lengths man may go for the sake of egocentric love. The instinct of self-preservation and care is not completely without merit. Yet once again, it is constantly under threat of distortion. The son of Thetis acted upon his own desires for the sake of his pride, despite the brutality of the war happening before him. He sacrificed thousands of Achaean lives, as well as Patroclus, in his intense worship of the ego. The third tablet of, mar tablet of marble portrayed the image of Odysseus, thrashing in the raging sea, his kingdom of Ithaca in the distance. Homo's poetry once again was inscribed in the stone. Now from his breast into his eyes the ache of longing mounted, and he wept at last. His dear wife, clear and faithful in his arms, longed for as the sun warmed earth. And so she too rejoiced, her gaze upon her husband, her white arms round him pressed as though forever. In many ways, Odysseus and his journey back from Troy displayed sacrifice in a positive light. The highest love of the great tactician was home. It was his wife, his son, it was his kingdom. Twenty years had passed since Odysseus had left to support Menelaus in the war against Troy, only ten of which were spent on Trojan soil. The remaining decade consisted of numerous tribulations for the Ithaca king, as he desperately strived to reach his homeland and family. By the favor of Athena and the strength of his own wit, Odysseus was able to survive the various challenges and opponents that appeared in his path. After surviving Cyclops, Sirens, Sorceresses, the wrath of monsters and gods alike, Odysseus is found at the beginning of the Odyssey, stranded on the island of the sea nymph Calypso. Odysseus lives and grieves upon that island in thraldom of the nymph. He cannot stir, he cannot fare homeward, for no ship is left to him fitted with oars, no crewman or companions to pull him on the broad back of the sea. Years had passed since the king of Ithaca had left his beloved. His ships and crew had been destroyed by constant hardship. The very sea was against him, and yet he still deeply yearned for home. When day came, he sat at the rocky shore and broke his own heart groaning with eyes wet, scanning the bare horizon of the sea. <coughs> when Odysseus was finally given the opportunity to leave Calypso's island, he did not hesitate to accept. Despite the adversity he was fated to face and the immortal nymphs offer for eternity by his side. Calypso challenged his decision to return to Penelope. Can I be less desirable than she? Less interesting? Can mortals compare with goddesses in grace and form? Calypso, however, had missed the point of Odysseus's yearning. Odysseus was not seeking the eternity of safety or pleasure. Odysseus was seeking connection and relationship. Odysseus knew that the love he shared with Penelope was worth the sacrifice it would take to get back to her. It was that very love that gave him the strength to say, let the trial come. Although Calypso had tempted him with the natural desires of man and had been under torment for years, Odysseus was willing to sacrifice it all for the sake of his beloved. The voyage of Odysseus back to Ithaca would forth an example of well-ordered love. 
<coughs> the king of Ithaca sacrificed his life and, in the case of Calypso, his pleasure for Penelope and his son Telemachus. The self-sacrificial desire brought by Odysseus's love is unlike that of Dido's, for the love between himself and his queen had grown in trust and strength in de for decades, as represented in the sturdy olive tree intertwined in their bed frame. The evening sun dappled into the ancient structure and onto the fourth and final plaque, depicting the image of a wolf crouching above a lamb as its jaws opened for the first taste of flesh. The description beneath the scene was taken from Plato's Phaedrus, as wolf to lamb, so lover to his object. Socrates, mentor of Plato, illustrated the analogy of wolf and lamb, predator and prey, in context of the discussion of love with Phaedrus. The comparison between wolf and lover was arguably a warning of a particular kind of love, the kind that occurs between one whose highest love is himself and his victim. When one's highest love is oneself, it naturally flows that one is willing to sacrifice everything else for one's own pleasure and gratification. Oftentimes, and in regards to this particular analogy, the offering consists of another. The predator simply loves that which he is receiving, whether it be emotional or physical pleasure, as does the wolf with the nutrients given by the lamb. The one who is driven by himself, the wolf, is willing to use and to devour his prey until nothing but hollow bones and a broken spirit is remaining. The illustration put forth by Socrates in Plato's dialogue describes the nature of abusive and its distorted love well. However, this analogy can be similarly applied to every context of love. In every form of love, platonic, familial, and romantic, is intertwined with sacrifice. It is the innate instinct of man to give to that which he adores. Every individual is in the position of the wolf, for every individual is willing to sacrifice a lamb for one's beloved, whether that lamb is oneself for others, as in Dido's case, or others for oneself, as in the case of Achilles. As seen in the example of Odysseus, the connection between love and sacrifice is not a negative thing. Instead, in its essence, it is natural and beautiful. In all their divinity, love and sacrifice are woven together. One cannot exist without the other. It is therefore vital that one must choose one's highest love carefully, for ultimately that choice will determine who or what will be the land that shall perish. The ancient walls surrounding the enclosure were a brilliant blend of colors, the plants reflecting the colors of the sky as the sun sank into the horizon. The soft face of Aphrodite glowed faintly in the light, shades of pink and orange sweeping across her nose and cheeks. The air held a chill, yet within the walls a wanderer could not help but feel an internal warmth. The greatest experience, the very essence of life, love. When one observes the world, it can be seen how love ultimately drives humanity. Till we are devoured by earth and time, our actions are drawn by a single thing. The object of our love and the choices of sacrifice that define us. Those of us who are loved, let us love till we are devoured. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaiser. Um, I would like to begin with, um, well, I, I'm afraid it's a fairly blunt question, but uh, at point in this paper, I was asking this question to myself. What is this paper about? This is analyzing how love ultimately is what drives people's actions, um, as well as, okay, if love drives actions, what exactly is love then. And it's a rather complicated term, and I wish I could have written a book instead of a paper about this. But what I realized as I was analyzing different characters whose actions were very explicitly drawn by love of something or themselves, I realized that sacrifice was involved in all of it, which led me to realize that love is sacrificial is a very 
I wouldn't say simple way of describing it because again, it's still rather complicated, but I think it's possible to analyze love and really measure it by whether the willingness or the existence of sacrifice is there. Yeah, it seemed like at the beginning of the paper you were talking about love as a motivation, but then the, the place of sacrifice came in fairly strongly. And I guess, could you explain I, um, how the theme of the relationship between love and sacrifice applies to the major example that you developed, namely Achilles and Dido? So for Dido, I found in her character there was often that scene of self-sacrifice. So. We don't see her relationship with Sychaeus in the Aeneid. We don't know that much about it. But after his death, she swore basically a life of solitude. Even though she was young and beautiful and it was completely within her right to remarry um, multiple times as she wished, as she was also the queen of Carthage, she wished to sacrifice her happiness and that companionship that is often so essential and desired in man for his sake. And so although it wasn't necessarily like, oh, she was putting her life on the line in this case, she was still sacrificing something of herself, in this case her happiness, for his sake. And then with Aeneas, she, I mean, she has sworn this oath to Sychaeus, so she had a conscience, she also had her reputation, and she gave that all for him. She was, because of her love for him, she was willing to give herself completely over to this character. And so her actual death isn't the sacrifice, that's more the consequences of her going too far. And then with Achilles, he was so wrapped up in his own pride, his own ego, that he was willing to not only let thousands of soldiers die because he and the Myrmidons weren't aiding in the war, but also he was willing to risk his best friend, who clearly we see after Patroclus' death that he is distraught over it, and he kind of then gets a little taste of the consequences for his actions, but he's willing to send his friends in dressed up as him, and he even says, you can win great glory for me. And then, I mean, ultimately Patroclus dies, and then he realizes I mean, again, he is distraught. I don't think he necessarily comes to any profound conclusion, like I should have worshiped my pride and my glory as much, but that, again, because the ego is his, his God, in a sense, his highest love, he, everything else, his own life, as well as the life of others, he is willing to sacrifice at that shrine. Okay, then I need you to clarify um, in what sense you mean that this paper is about the self-sacrificial nature of love. Uh, in the case of Achilles, obviously this does not appear to be romantic love that he's exemplifying. Um, it seems to be love of a particular object that is eternal honor. And so, um, are we talking about two different things? Are we talking about desire in general? Are we talking about romantic love specifically? What, talking, what's the object? We're talking about love in more of a broader sense. Dido and Odysseus, both it is kind of romantic love, although I would argue it was more than just Penelope that brought Odysseus home. I think it was also his son and his homeland in general. But every form of love, as I say at the end of my paper, has sacrifice in it. If you love your friend or your family or your partner, there should be a sense of willingness to sacrifice for them. But if your highest love is yourself, obviously you're willing to potentially harm others for your own gratification, pleasure, or um, whatever that may be. So it's not just focused on self-sacrifice. Um, that was Dido's example, it's kind of that self-sacrificial desire. Achilles was more of the sacrifice of others because Self-sacrificial desire, although it is quite prominent when you actually love others, it's not the only thing that exists. Again, in the case of the wolf and the lamb, the wolf is willing to absolutely devour the lamb for its own sake. So we're looking at the not only how love drives actions, we're also looking how 
okay, if love drives actions, what is love? Well, love involves sacrifice. How do we see this play out in characters that we've read, as well as what are some extreme examples? Because Again, it's kind of like, okay, you need a balance of it then. In order to love well, how do you exactly do that? So obviously some sort of self-sacrifice is necessary because you see that with Odysseus and you see an extreme lack of that with Achilles, but also you can't go as far as Dido and completely give yourself so much to other people or one particular person that you destroy yourself. Okay, so in the case of Dido, it does seem fairly clear that at least romantic love has a self-sacrificial element, even to the point of one's destruction. Um, sometimes people give themselves entirely up for romantic love. Samson seems to also another very good example of that particular tendency. Um, now, in Achilles' case, um, you've said that he worships the ego and that uh, he sacrifices others. However, in the instance of Achilles, it's himself that must be sacrificed in order to gain honor. If he gains honor, he will die young. He will lose himself um, and in exchange for the thing he loves, which is honor. And so in what sense is Achilles any different from Dido or uh, Odysseus in that they give up themselves in order to obtain what they love? Mm -hmm. I definitely think, and again, if I had more I probably would have gone into a really sacrifice of his physical body because although it's so egocentric in the sense that it is his own glory and his own pride, he definitely, it's more particular than just himself. I mean, he is willing to give up his physical body and his pleasure in a sense for that, but it goes to the extent that he also sacrifices others first and in general, and so I wanted to focus on that aspect rather than also him sacrificing himself, because I think that's another danger that comes across when you love others, or when you love yourself. Mm -hmm. So egocentric love doesn't necessarily, isn't completely, I guess, simplified to just love of your physical body and physical pleasure. I think it can also kind of branch off into like your success or your wealth or your glory. Those things are still revolving around you and typically you're first willing to sacrifice others for that sake, but it does also include some self-sacrifice if it's that particular thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was also wondering in the instance of Dido, how much she also sacrifices others uh, when she gives herself to her relationship with Aeneas, she is imperiling her ability to effectively govern Carthage and uh, ends up destroying herself when she had people that she needed to be responsible to. Um, has Dido sacrificed her own citizens um, in order to attain her narrow pleasure of this particular relationship? In the case of her actual death, I think at that point she did obviously like she had her sister and she had her citizens. But in the cases, that was more, I wanted to use that as more, again, the result of her overwhelming self-sacrificial desire towards a particular object. I did mention that because it was so focused on one person, not just people in general, like others, that, that also, again, I almost pictured like if you have like, some sort of like plate of water, and if everything's balanced with your love, like you love your family and your friends and your partner if you have one, and maybe your responsibility and your job, if everything's all balanced, you know, there's like kind of water everywhere. But as soon as it tips to one particular thing, that's when there's a deficiency of love in certain areas. So in the case of her death, I would argue that clearly she, her sister, because of how much she had destroyed herself, her sister and her citizens suffered for that. However, in, if Aeneas had reciprocated the love more or given her some sort of sense of like acknowledgement and not been completely apathetic, I don't think she would have died. So her actual acts of self-sacrifice, I don't think was necessarily 
it was harmful to others in the long run, but more because things didn't work out. I don't know how she was with Psycheus and the sacrifices she made in that relationship, but her sacrifice for Psycheus after he died, she was a, success, a successful queen when she was still living in mourning. And so, again, it's complicated, which is why I wish I had more time and probably should have chosen a different topic. But, yeah. And with the instance that you gave in the definition of love, what is the love of the love of the wolf? Mm -hmm. um, that is the conclusion of Plato's second speech. And um, the third speech gives um, the definition of love as divine madness. Mm -hmm. And um, that second definition seems to be primarily what you work off in the paper. Is there a reason why the third definition is not more prominent in your thinking? What I liked about The Wolf and the Lamb is I found it applicable to all scenarios and all, I guess, types of love. I think the romantic love, I think, can definitely be classified as almost like a divine madness. Um, and I do love that last speech of Phaedrus when he describes the soul growing its wings and um, talks about love in a, a better light as it is known as the golden speech. But I think, again, as I described in that last portion, I think everyone is in the position of the wolf, in a sense. And everyone has something or someone that they are willing to sacrifice for whatever their highest love is. Um, that could be, like, it could be the sacrifice of time, it could be the sacrifice of energy, it could be the sacrifice of friendships, relationships, or it could be to more extremes and actually be harmful to others as well. So I think what I, I guess what I was trying to convey with this paper is if we are to love well, as that is such an important aspect of life, and as I didn't talk about or mention biblical references in this, but I knew my audience were believers for the most part, and so I know they also understand that love is a huge part of our calling. So I wanted to analyze, okay, what really is love? Is it, if it is so important and so influential to every aspect of our life, what does that necessarily entail? And because I saw sacrifice as such a huge piece of that, what I guess I wanted to kind of convey with this paper is almost a warning, like choose your highest love well and also choose what you're willing to sacrifice as well. Because depending on what your highest love is, that dictates what you will sacrifice for the most part. If your highest love is yourself, there is a great potential that others are going to suffer for that. If your highest love is only one particular person, there is also a potential that others would suffer for that. So it's almost like a warning. Again, looking at some extremes, looking at one example that is not so gruesome um, to show that you do need to be careful. It is clearly a huge part of our human existence and you can't escape from sacrifice with love. If you truly love something, you are willing to sacrifice something, someone, or yourself for that person to different degrees. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Other questions? However, I would like to push back a little bit on your statement that Dido's death was a result, was a result at least from Aeneas's, at least apart from Aeneas's indifference and his not loving her, especially in comparison with Odysseus. Um, you see, you see how Dido reacts to Psyche's death within the poem. She vows not to remarry and to live the life alone. And I would say that that is already displaying destructive tendencies where she is putting her own feelings and her own love for this one individual above everything else that she has responsibility towards. Um, because she's bound to live alone, she's not producing an heir, which is bringing instability to the kingdom. She's letting, so she's, failing in a lot of her other responsibilities because of this overwhelming desire for this only for only this one particular person. Whereas contrasted with Odysseus, 
he seemed to be a character who had his loves in order and in the proper proportion. He had reverence towards Athena, he had a deep love for his wife, but he also had this identity as the king of Ithaca and the father of his son. And the, all these responsibilities were in order in his life, at least in the end of the poem. Um, so I would argue that maybe it's not because of the sort of strength of his passion or feeling that leads to certain actions about whether or not they're in the right order and that you have maybe enough loves in your life. Is that a question? <laughs> so um, I, I can respond to it. Yeah, like what, what exactly okay. do you think of the sort of differing consequences of, you know, preparing data to it? So, I mean, I hope my paper was semi-clear and I actually agree with that. I think the reason I use Dido as an example of excess of self-sacrificial love is because she did do that and it did lead to her destruction. Again, her giving herself completely to Aeneas when he had only been there for a short period of time, she had no really way of again, what I like so much about Penelope and Odysseus is there was trust and there was respect built over the years. I mean, when Odysseus comes back to Penelope, she challenges him. She's like, are you the same man that I married? There's definitely, they sacrifice for each other, they risk a lot for each other, but because again, Penelope was within her full rights to get married. Odysseus was in his full rights in that culture to do what he wished, to stay different places, he didn't have to go home. But he also knew that Penelope would be faithful. And Penelope had faith that Odysseus would come home with her. So they have that self-sacrifice, but again, like you said, it is well-ordered, which is why I use him as a good example. And again, there's kind of that mutual exchange that is so important in a romantic partnership. Um, for Dido, again, I would agree with you that she because of her giving herself so completely to first Sycaeus completely and then Aeneas completely, that is what ultimately led to her destruction because she, when, Odys when Aeneas left, especially because he was so apathetic to her, she had this huge understanding that like self-sacrifice in the case of love. And he didn't even cry for her. He didn't even stay a little bit longer so she could learn to grieve. So he had no matter what his own internal feelings were, had kind of slapped her in the face, which led to her soul being completely overwhelmed and I would argue killed by not only his actions, but then you also have the guilt and it's just a lot of very complex emotions. So again, I would agree with you that she definitely showed destructive habits in her self-sacrifice, which is why I used her as an example of pretty much what she not to do. So you say that maybe that failing in her is a result from her not having enough loves in her life, and instead of having the proper love for her kingdom or her sister, or even maybe she needs a hobby. Um, she only she gave all the love that she should have given to other things to this one object, and would you say that that was what caused so much destruction? Yes and no. I think the fact that it was focused on one particular person is certainly, in any case, not good. Again, that focus on, you. everyone has a highest love, but ideally you have sub higher loves. Like, obviously when you're married, your spouse should be your highest love. In the Christian sense, you know, God should be your highest love. But as parents, you should also love your kids. So, there's definitely levels to that, but I think also there always is some sort of self-respect that is necessary. I think you could give yourself completely to multiple people and it would still result in destruction. I think you could still be so giving of yourself, even if you have multiple people, if that is in balance with some sort of self-respect, I think it would still end in destruction. So again, yes and no. I think if obviously if she had given herself also to her kingdom and to her sister, she wouldn't have died per se, but I think it still would have been disoriented. Yes. That makes sense. Okay. So I really enjoyed hearing your brainstorm also, but I just wanted to, so kind of to build upon your talk about the love of the love of the strong kind of, I'm just wondering if you would equate 
um, greater level of sacrifice, it's like a greater level of love, or what would you say to like? Like you're willing to sacrifice more when you love something? Yeah, greater. Like, would you say that someone's putting in more sacrifice in a relationship when you put in more love in a relationship? Or? Um, I think. understand you, the more you're asking if I believe that the more you love someone or something, the more you're willing to sacrifice for it. Yeah, would you say that it'd be like, a, for example, like a deeper or like more tight relationship would require more sacrifice versus like a newer relationship? I think yes. I mean, again, looking at it in both a platonic and a romantic sense, when you just become friends with someone, if you kind of immediately jump into great levels of sacrifice for them, that's dangerous for oneself. Same in a romantic sense, if you just begin to date someone and you give yourself so completely to that person, you lay down everything for them, that is incredibly dangerous. I think, again, going back to Odysseus and Penelope, what made their self-sacrifice so ordered, I guess, is not only, again, Odysseus had other loves as well. Again, his son in his homeland, but also, again, there's kind of that mutual strength. I mean, you aren't, we understand that you shouldn't give yourself completely to another person until you're married. And that's, that's for our protection, that's for our, so we don't hurt ourselves. So I think as you grow into a deeper relationship with that person, whether it is platonic or romantic, a different sort of willingness usually surfaces um, a deeper willingness to sacrifice for that person if you truly love them. But also, I think it is safer in a sense. I mean, it still has risks because you're dealing with another broken person, but it's not quite as foolish as just like going all in right after that. <coughs>
I realized as I was like practicing my paper on like 10 o'clock last night that I didn't explicitly label the fact that Dido sacrificed herself as a selfless thing. So no, I don't think, I mean, I would argue because of the fallenness of man, there is no completely selfless act. I would argue that only like Christ's sacrifice was completely selfless because he is also fully God. So I think there is some form of self-interest in even very sacrificial acts um, in some level or some form of subcon um, subconscious. But, so no, I don't think it was necessarily a selfless thing because again, she did harm her sister and harm her kingdom. So it wasn't I wouldn't label it as, well, I guess you could say it was selfish in the way that she did ignore her other responsibilities, but at the same time, like, looking at everything she had been through, I hesitate to label her as selfish because I do greatly feel for her situation and the, just the brokenness that she was in. So, no, I'm not saying, she, self, I don't think self-sacrificial desire has to be selfless. Yeah. Uh, first off, Lovely things, really quite gorgeous. Um, I had a question. So you've talked about a lot about you know sacrificing oneself too much for one thing. Um, and in the Bible, we are commanded to love each other as Christ loves us. So given that Christ sacrificed himself completely, how would you interpret that? Well, there's also scripture that says love one another as you love yourself. And I think that is also a very important piece that is often missed in a lot of circles. Um, I think as believers, obviously, you are called to be like the hands and feet of Christ. You are called to serve others. But taking that to the extremes and losing yourself or, again, not having, being so serving of others that you damage yourself, we do also understand that we can't pour from an empty cup. So there does have to be some form of level of self-love, some sort of fulfillment and pouring into you. Obviously, it's a very like contextual thing. People are called to do different things. Some people are called to go into really dangerous areas to be missionaries. Other people are called to work in the office. And all of those are valid and all of those can be used for God's glory and the serving of others. But again, I think it's very important to remember the verse that does talk about loving others as you love yourself. And that piece so often gets kind of pushed under the rug and not really discussed in depth because I feel like not only is it a great temptation for a lot of people to have such a lack of self-respect or have such a lack of self-love, um, and it's seen as a good thing in a sense. Overworking yourself for others is seen like, oh, you're such a good person, you're such a good Christian, you're so selfless, but if you're destroying yourself, in a way that Christ does not intend just for the sake of destroying yourself, I don't believe that is biblical. Okay, now we go. Yeah, you seem to have difficulty describing the extent to which sacrifice should be given in um, the act of love. And I begin to wonder if perhaps we're using the wrong word. Um, sacrifice is something that's usually given to the gods. Aristotle, in the context of friendship, says it's goodwill that we should have to others. Um, can we avoid the, you might say, the whole problem if we just use the term goodwill is what we are supposed to have rather than sacrifice? I kind of disagree with that. I mean, you could label it as more serving of others if you're talking about it in, um, like, how it should be. But I think, again, when you look at all sorts of different situations and different contexts, Sacrifice is definitely involved. Again, I kind of, I like the wolf and the lamb example because I think everyone is in the position of the wolf and has the choice or the opportunity to sacrifice things. Again, like, you can use the term like, oh, I'm going to sacrifice my time to focus on this one person. I'm going to sacrifice my energy to go above and beyond this one person or, um, this one group of people. So I kind of stand by that word because I think under 
understanding the weight, I think is important. I think using other terms could potentially like disregard the weight that actually is involved with it. Again, I think oftentimes even Christians sacrificing things that they think is honoring to God isn't or is hurtful and harmful to others. So I think using sacrifice gives the appropriate weight to like your choices and again the choice of what is your highest love and what are you willing to destroy potentially for it. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaiser.